thinking about moving to Spain, you should. Spain is a great place to live, and I love it. In fact, many days that I wake up and find myself still in Spain, I feel pretty lucky just to have my life here, rather than, well, back on the ranch in Arizona. But if you're thinking of moving to Spain, you should probably get some kind of work permit before coming, or at least a residence permit if you don't intend to get a job. And that's the topic for today, because getting a work visa to move to Spain is not always as simple as you might imagine. I'm Daniel Welsh, coming to you from beautiful Barcelona, and this is Spain to Go, the best podcast in the entire multiverse about all things Spain. And today I'm going to tell you about the process of getting a work permit in Spain. It's not going to be pretty. First, a tiny story. About 10 or so years ago, back in the marvelous spring of 2012, marvelous except for the huge economic crisis, of course, there's an episode on here about the economic crisis. It was quite a time. But yes, in the otherwise marvelous spring of 2012, my boss asked me to sit down with a girl named Christina to advise her about getting a Spanish work permit. I'd just gotten mine through Arraigo Social, a process in which you have to prove your integration into Spanish society, present a lot of papers, and hope for the best. It had taken me, for a series of stupid reasons, seven years to actually get legal. I wrote about it a little in my article on the blog called Spanish Lawyers. But finally, seven years later, I was legal, and it felt great. The lawyers tell me I should use the word irregular to describe my previous situation, but let me tell you, it felt a whole lot like illegality. I even have a letter dated 2010 in my files here at home inviting, or perhaps obliging me, to leave Spanish territory within the next 15 days. I don't remember getting this letter, and I guess I didn't leave. I reapplied for the same arraigo social, and on the second time, I got it. In any case, my first seven years in Spain, I was illegal. Illegal like a guy in a Tigres del Norte song. That's the type of Mexican music we hear a lot of back in Arizona. I don't know if people outside of northern Mexico and southern Arizona listen to Los Tigres, but I recommend you give them a listen as soon as this podcast is over. Anyway, back to 2012. Cristina had come to Spain on a tourist visa and was working under the table at the same language school in Madrid that I was. This was typical back in the day. I don't know if it still is, but it was a bit Wild West. Anyway, now that she was here, she wanted to get legal, or as the lawyers and gastroenterologists call it, regular. So I sat with her in a cafe and explained arraigo social. You hang out in Spain for three years, keep a lot of papers proving you were here the whole time, go to a few appointments with social workers, get a criminal background check from the FBI, better I don't even tell you what that involves, and finally, present a job offer, and then hope. It's not easy, but I think it's actually a great system. I wish the U.S. had something similar. A clear path to citizenship, as they're saying these days. But Christina wasn't convinced. I just got here, she said, and I don't want to wait three years. Want, huh? I explained again. There are several ways to get work permits in Spain, but just wanting one isn't going to get you through the police station at Aluche. She was insistent, though. I don't want to wait for three years. I want a visa now. I looked at my watch. Oops, I forgot. I've got a class across town in an hour. Sorry, Christina. Massive sense of entitlement visas are hard to get, and I don't think there's any country that gives you a visa based on I've always wanted to live here. Most of them make you contribute something to society, 
Money or skilled labor seem to be popular choices. Otherwise, I found bureaucracy isn't really based on what you want. Anyway, fast forward five years, during which one of my main concerns in life, besides online dating, was working enough actual on-contract hours to be able to renew my work permit when I had to. Giving private lessons under the table would have been more profitable, thanks to Spanish taxation, but I had to show the government I was actually working on contract. A lot had changed in the meantime. I'd become an author. I was mostly working for myself on my online business. I'd been through a lot. Also, I'd decided I was going to stay in Spain forever. So, I'd recently put in the papers for the long-term residence permit, the one that gives you five years of legal residency. If that was approved, I'd be legal in more or less a permanent way. With the larga duración, all you have to do is show up at the police station once every five years and renew your ID card. It was pretty exciting. I sat in all the waiting rooms, took a number, paid the fees, put my fingerprint on the little glass screen. You know, the whole deal. Finally, the man or lady, I can't remember, at the police station told me, come back in 40 days for the card. And so approximately 40 days later, I went back to Aluche and picked up my permanent residency. It was and still is one of the best days of my life. I'd spent 12 years at that point busting my ass on the daily to levantar España. I'd gone through all the shitty jobs, the shared flats in Lucero and Vallecas, the economic crisis, and the general misery. And finally, I was fully legal. I could legally, after all this time, give up my day job and start making real money. Like a guy in a Tigres del Norte song, but one of the more optimistic ones. I'm not even saying the names of these songs, incidentally, because uh, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to translate the, um, the vocabulary into English. It might come across badly. So anyway, you should just listen to the Tigres on your own. In any case, after that, I went home and I swore I'd never go through another visa process again for as long as I lived. A few weeks later, I met Morena and the Spanish immigration adventures began again. When I met Morena, she was doing a PhD in nanotechnology, whatever that is. She'd hang out in a laboratory all day, wearing a surgical mask long before it was cool, and doing experiments on cancer cells, putting them into petri dishes, something like that. I don't know. Anyway, we met, sparks flew, it was the big L-U-V. And now, she's my wife. But then, she was just a young student. And soon after we met, they fired her from her job at the lab. She was offered another job in a different field up here in Barcelona. And logically, we started to wonder about her visa renewal process. We went to several lawyers and they told us, sorry, but the government is not going to renew your visa. She came to do the one job in the lab. It was a highly qualified visa. And that job in the lab was all she was allowed to legally do. So, the lawyers told us, just hope nobody in the bureaucracy notices that you're still here. They'll kick you out so fast, it'll make your head spin. Okay, they didn't say that. They would have sent her the same letter that I got, inviting me to leave Spain within 15 days. One lawyer even told us, all you have to do is find a job that pays 58,000 euros a year or more. We were both very angry at that statement because... Almost nobody in Spain earns 58,000 euros a year or more, but this lawyer was convinced that it would be easy to just wander into some company, ask them for 58,000 euros, and uh, be able to renew based on being a highly qualified and very well-paid individual. Finally, we decided to go for the nuclear option. The famous Pareja de Hecho and Reagrupación Familiar. I believe pareja de hecho is what they call a civil union back home. 
Not exactly like marriage, but almost. Usually, people wait years for this, years just to get an appointment in some government office somewhere. But Morena was smarter than those people. Rather than hiring the worst lawyer in town, as I would have done, we spent our first morning after moving to Barcelona talking to one of the best. His name is Christian Balcells. You could talk to him too. Google Balcells Group, B-A-L-C-E-L-L-S, and you'll find them. Christian was actually quite reassuring. He told us the deal for reagrupación familiar. That would mean in English something like family regrouping. Um, he told us about it, and when we asked him to set up the pareja de hecho appointment, he just called up a notary. It took no time at all, maybe a week to get the appointment. We went to a fancy office near Diagonal here in Barcelona. Balcells sent an interpreter along. We signed some papers while sitting under an original painting by Juan Miro. And boom, ten minutes later we were officially a pareja de hecho. We went out for a celebratory glass of cava at 10.30 in the morning, and then Morena went off to work. This was all going smoothly. Or so we thought. However, we had some surprises with Barcelona real estate coming while we proceeded, and things were about to get more difficult. You should probably listen to the song Let's Lynch the Landlord by the Dan Kennedys while reading this bit. Because after Pareja de Hecho, the first thing we needed to do was get a certificate saying we were living in decent conditions. And we were, barely. We were in Barceloneta, in a tiny flat just a few meters from the beach. It didn't have AC, but it did have a ceiling fan. So off to City Hall I went. I presented the rent contract and paid a small fee, and two days later they called me. No can do, said the very polite woman who called. You need a real rent contract. Apparently, our 11-month contract wasn't good enough for the bureaucracy. So what do you suggest, I asked. Should we move? No, no, just talk to your landlord or landlady. I'm sure he or she would be happy to help you out. We talked to the landlady. No luck. She was no help at all. The woman from City Hall didn't know Gigi, the Belgian landlady from hell. Hasta nunca, Gigi. We decided to move. Moving to a new flat in Barcelona is like shoveling large amounts of money into a hot furnace. But hey, gotta do what you gotta do. We only ended up moving about three blocks up the street, so we could stay in Barceloneta near the beach. We got a better contract and a better house, and it was only costing us 300 euros more every month. Pro tip, don't sign an 11-month contract ever. It later caused problems with our tax situation. It's considered to be a temporary rent contract, not a permanent residency. We didn't know, but from me to you, don't sign an 11-month contract. Also, don't live in Barcelona. It's expensive AF up here. After that, there wasn't much to do but wait. In case you couldn't imagine, all this took months of my life. Standing in line at one government office, only to be sent across town to another government office, where someone would tell you either to go back to the first place or, oh no, you have to do that online. Struggling with official websites, which only work with Windows 95, and a version of Adobe Acrobat that was banned in most civilized countries decades ago, but, finally, in the new flat, a woman came to inspect our lifestyle to see that we weren't living six to a room in bunk beds. She took some notes, measured the place with a little pointy laser, asked some questions, made sure our water heater worked. She was nice. I hope you get approved, she said as she left. But from this point, it's out of my hands. She told me I could pick up the report on the adequacy of my home at yet another government office in about 40 days. So again, we waited. Finally, I got it. The informe de adecuación de la vivienda. After that, it was just a matter of getting the appointment with the immigration people. Guess what? Another six months wait. 
Well, nobody said getting a Spanish work permit was going to be fast or easy. Anyway, in case you don't know us personally, now is probably the time I should mention that Morena is from a town in the south of India. She wants me to tell you at this point that they have a lot of coconut trees, amazing food, awesome beaches, and the richest temple in the world. Also, a lot of different kinds of bananas. I've recently been there. We had our wedding there. It's a nice place. Go to Kerala, the region, or the city of Trivandrum, and have fun. Anyway, at this point in our Spanish residence permit journey, it was time for her to go home. Her previous residency was expiring, and so she went. I think they make this process a bit less of a pain in the ass if one of the partners is officially Spanish, but I'm not sure. So again, gotta do what you gotta do, and in Morena's case, that meant waiting for slow-ass Spanish bureaucracy in her hometown, with occasional trips to the Spanish embassy in Mumbai. I guess you could compare this part of the adventure to shoveling large stacks of money into the core of a nuclear reactor during a meltdown. But on the plus side, I got a trip to Asia out of it. A few weeks after Morena left, in fact, I was in India myself. And it was quite an adventure, let me tell you. I'd never been to that part of the world before. Mumbai, and then Goa. Later, Thailand. I only had explosive diarrhea about half the time, and even that was manageable. After a month in the tropics, I came back to Spain, presented the final papers to the immigration people, and once again started waiting. And about the middle of February, this was... 2020, by the way, Morena called from India. She was freaking out about some coronavirus thing in a city in China I'd never heard of. Psh, I said, don't worry. By the end of March, we'll have forgotten all about it. Remember the avian flu? Remember SARS? Well, as literally everyone on the planet knows by now, I was wrong about the Rona. A few days later, though, we got the official approval. I might have been a little drunk when Morena called to tell me the news. Just kidding. I was very drunk. But either way, I cried like a baby on the phone. Finally, Morena could come back to Spain. And so, come back to Spain she did, right at the beginning of March 2020. Long story short, she had the appointment to get fingerprinted for her new ID card right around March 15th. So, that didn't work out. Police stations were closed. Everything was closed. All appointments canceled until further notice. The worry never ends, does it? We were so close to being done, and then the whole country went into lockdown. I don't need to tell you how much 2020 sucked for everyone. You were there. But a few months into the lockdown, the lawyer called and said that the police station was open for emergency situations, possibly like ours. We could go, explain the situation, and they might work with us. So we went. We stood in a social distancing line outside the police station on a beautiful spring day in a beautiful city. It was one of the first times we'd been out of the house for an extended period of time in quite a while. And it was great, except for the dystopian ambience of everything in those months. Actually, this felt like sort of a return to normal life. The police decided that our emergency was valid, and they took Morena's fingerprints. And another 40 days later, we went to pick up her new card. She was finally fully legal, or regular, whatever you want to call it. And all it took was a buttload of money and a year and a half of my sanity. A lot has happened since then, and now there are new options for Spanish work permits. The Reagrupación Familiar works if one person is already legal. And like I said, I got legal through Arraigo Social, just hanging out on my tourist visa for years and years until finally they accepted me as an honest, tax-paying, and sort of integrated citizen of the realm. Anyway... In my episode called Working in Spain, I believe it's episode number 14, I explain some of the different kinds of visas. There's the work permit. There's also a non-lucrative if you have a lot of money to spend. 
I forget the exact amounts, but if you can spend half a million euros on a house or buy something like two or three million euros worth of Spanish government bonds, they will give you residency. If you have that kind of money just sitting around, good for you. Please, come on out. We'd love to have you. The thing is, you have to apply for that in the Spanish embassy nearest you, and it doesn't allow you to work. A lot of people have been coming on a non-lucrative visa and working remotely, but it's not officially how you're supposed to do things. The good news, though, is that soon the Spanish government will have a digital nomad visa. I don't have much to say about it because the official law has not been finalized yet. They've got some of it done, and I believe by the end of March, they're supposed to have the rest finalized. But there's nothing official so far. It's supposed to be a faster process. I don't know. The government says they're going to make these laws at a certain rate, and then other things happen. They said they were getting rid of daylight savings time about three years ago, and we're still doing that. So I have limited faith, but we will see. In any case, after the digital nomad visa comes into effect, there's always a period of time where nobody really knows how to apply the laws. That includes the funcionarios, the, um, the bureaucrats, I guess, who are sitting in offices applying these laws all day long. They don't really get a briefing. They just have to try to figure it out. And so it could be a little bit weird for a while. But I'm sure that with the help of a good lawyer, people will be getting digital nomad visas soon. That's the last bit of advice I have today. As usual, just get a lawyer. Every time somebody asks me for legal advice, it's useless. I can read legal Spanish, but I'm not the person who should be telling you how the law works. Get a lawyer for 50 or 60 bucks. Some very good lawyers will sit down with you for half an hour and tell you what you need to do, or maybe they'll just tell you that what you're planning to do is impossible, but at least you find out that way rather than spending years of your life applying for visas that nobody is ever going to give you. So, I mentioned Christian at Balsell's group earlier. There's also in Madrid, you could check out Melcart Abogados, M-E-L-C-A-R-T. In Madrid, I think they're at melcartabogados.com. That's abogados, the Spanish word for lawyers. They're pretty good. I know Roberto over there. He's helped me with some stuff. He's a smart guy, and you should check them out. Anyway, those are my recommendations for lawyers in Madrid and Barcelona. I'm sure there are other people in other regions as well. And with that, thank you very much for listening. I hope you have a great day, wherever you are in the world. Feel free to follow me on Instagram, Daniel Welsh. You've got the spelling right in front of you on whatever app you're listening to. You could follow me on Facebook if you're into that. I'm not too active. You could give a star rating to this podcast, either on Apple or on Spotify or maybe other places you might be listening to it. You could make a donation at expatmadrid.com slash donate. You could buy me a virtual vermouth. You could buy me a hundred virtual vermouths. You could donate as much as you want or as little as you want. I'm happy with anything just to motivate me to keep doing this free podcast. You could also, if you chose, go to expatmadrid.com and sign up for my email updates. My email updates will tell you when I've got new podcasts, new videos about learning Spanish. I have a channel on YouTube called Learn Spanish with Daniel. It's pretty obvious what I do there. And uh, you could support that. You could subscribe to that. You could like 
that. You could, as I was saying, enter your email on expatmadrid.com and I will send you a few things. And that's about all I've got for today. I hope, once again, that you're doing well. Thank you for listening and we will talk soon. Hasta la próxima. Bye.